President Clinton, it's Wednesday, November 9th, Thursday, November 9th, the day after the election, we have a new president. I put President Clinton, you can pick anybody you want. President, what's her name, Stein, President Stein, uh, President Trump, whoever you want. But your person has won. The day after, you happen to be in an elevator. You can't read that. It got too small. Um, with the new Secretary of Education. I said, it's Linda Darling Hammond. Put whoever you want. <laughs> like, this is your fantasy. OK? Maybe it's you. I, this is your fantasy, whoever this is. And there you are. It's a dream come true. You got a 30-second elevator ride, and she turns to you and said, says, what should we do to make teacher preparation better? Jot down your answer. Now hold on to this. We're going to come back to this and hold on to this as we walk through our discussion today, and we will revisit this. So my argument today is going to be that we have a lot of consensus about the answer to that question. I've put up here some areas where I think we have consensus. But you spend your careers doing this. You could, I'm sure we could move that around, change it. I think there's a lot of consensus on what needs to happen to make teacher preparation so that we get a profession-ready teacher on day one. Profession-ready, not an expert, but somebody who's ready. OK? Um, I think what we do in our world is we tend to focus on what we disagree on. We don't spend nearly as much time articulating and promoting what we know from scholarship and experience to be true. And I think the culture of higher education, of research, of scholarship is a culture of critique. Your doctoral students, aren't you taught to ask questions, what's your research question, you know, that sort of thing. We don't really have a culture where we come together and promote an answer or a solution. At least that is my argument. I don't think that in higher ed in particular, there's much reinforcement for that. We'll take our friend Ken here, who sticks his neck out all the time, um, but that doesn't you know, he's at a point where he doesn't have to worry about a lot of things that many of you do, like tenure. Uh, you know, what kind of credit do you get for writing an op-ed that criticizes a lot of what's going on? Uh, none. In fact, it's a liability. So I think in some ways, you know, no, but I know that's a very broad statement, and there are many, many reasons for that that are beyond the pay grade of certainly me and this group. But I think we have to think about that when we think about why are we in this situation where teacher prep is under such assault? And I would assert that there's a few things we know based on everything we've done, and we have not told our story. So the opening is there for others to walk in. Um, when I worked in the Senate, we used to describe this as, oh, look, they're circling the wagons and shooting inward. And you know that notion of, I have to read it here because I can't remember it, Franklin, uh, Ben Franklin's, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly we shall all hang separately. Uh, we all hang together. And I think that's part of our culture. And that's, that can be a good thing. Differences of opinion, flourishing ideas. I mean, that's what the academy is all about. But when we come to the world of public policy, I assert it's a liability. So just hold that in mind. Challenges to the field. So these are real time challenges that I think um, are really, really pushing a lot of attention on teacher prep in particular. Um, and I think every, every person in, an, in a public policy office, their job really is to solve problems. I mean, it may not appear to us that that's the case. <laughs> but I always walk into the Hill assuming that's why they're there. And what are the problems they're trying to solve? And there are many. But I believe that these are pretty big 
and are pretty much agreed on. The issue of shortages, I know you've got it here. <coughs> Some states, um, Clark County in uh, Nevada, which is where Las Vegas is, reported a thousand openings on the first day of school last year. A thousand, that means no body in front of the students. Um, this, is, this is critical. This is, you know, something, you have to do something if you're in that position. Uh, teacher turnover, retention, inequitable distribution. We know it's the kids who need the most experienced teachers who are least likely to get them. Lack of diversity, low enrollment in prep programs. So let's look at the teacher shortage crisis. See my little cartoon there? Can you see it? <laughs> Finish up here, we need you to teach, th teach third period math. <laughs> uh, the U.S. was short 60,000 teachers last year. It, you know, if things go on the way they are, that could reach 100,000. A lot of this is taken from the Learning Policy Institute, uh, the group that Linda darling Hammond started with many other researchers. I really urge you to go to their website. They've got multiple reports, and she's great at synthesizing things and making it relevant to policy. 35% uh, decline in enrollment in teacher prep programs the last five years. That's about the highest it's ever been, to my knowledge, that that trajectory has been so steep. Um, teacher salaries over the span of a career are about 70% of what other college graduates make. So not the most appealing career. Half of all schools and 90% of high poverty schools struggle to find special ed teachers. That's my field and many of you I know as well. There's always been a shortage of special ed teachers. Now it's just worse. Um, a lot of reasons for that. Four times as many uncertified teachers in high minority versus low minority school schools. High poverty schools often staffed by a rotating cast of substitutes. All right, Ken, what do you think? I'll let you do this. We're going to see a quick video. Ken, my technology expert. <laughs> but there are classrooms without qualified math and science teachers. School systems say they just cannot find instructors. For example, inside this portable classroom at Bret Hart Middle School in Oakland, California, is an eighth grade math class that's been without a regular math teacher for most of the year. How many math teachers have you had? Uh, let's see, there is um, Mr. Berry, Ms. Gaines, Mr. Lee, Mr. Dijon, uh, Mr. Franklin, and Coach Brown was one of our substitutes one day. So we had Ms. Nakasako, we had Ms. Gaines, we had Ms. Elmore, we had this other man named, um, he had like curly hair, his name was Mr. Um, so you've had so many teachers you can't, can't remember, remember all their names. Yeah. A few miles away at Oakland High School, this ninth grade science class has had nothing but substitutes all year long, the entire year without a certified science teacher. Wow, what has that been like, having, what, 16 teachers or seven or nine during the year? It's just weird. It's like we have to get used to a new teacher every couple of weeks or so. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling shorthanded because this the third year. Ever since I've gotten in junior high school, I haven't had a science teacher. So you've had substitutes? All three years. All we learn is like the same thing all over again. When a new teacher comes, sometimes we've got to skip chapters and start all over again, and it's difficult. Have you learned much science this year? Nope. Not really. I haven't had a chance to. It breaks my heart. Nancy Caruso teaches science at Oakland High School. People have come from those classes over there and they come down and they beg me, can I get into your class? Please, I want to learn. I need a science class. And they're not getting it. I think we all know that, but there's something really powerful about hearing it from students. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll get to that point. Anybody physics teachers in here? So what causes the shortages? 
Um, again, this is from Linda's researcher from the Learning Policy Institute. Uh, the growth in the K-12 student enrollment, we're going to see that continue into the next decade. Uh, recovery from the 2008 recession, a lot of teachers were laid off, class size got bigger, that now is changing. Teacher turnover is 8% annually. Uh, I think if we got it down to 4%, that would be, that would, you know, go a long way. Uh, 40 to 50% leave in the first five years. Um, I think it's 50% in the first three years in special ed. Is that right, Selma? Is that, yeah, so it's even more significant there. Uh, high need students most effective and declining enrollment in prep programs, both alternate route and higher ed. Um, so that, that says a lot. Our pipeline doesn't look good. Though there was a report I just saw that in California the enrollment went up last year slightly. Uh, but that's only part of the challenge. Why do teachers leave? Compensation. A lot of states, I don't know if it's happened here in my home state of North Carolina, beginning teacher salary, or teacher salary has been capped so that if you're teaching for 30 years or something, the most you can make is like $45,000. And guess what? Teachers left the state. Shocking. So there, there's, you? I am, I'm a teacher from North Carolina. No, and you left because? I rest my case. <laughs> wow. If you went to Tennessee, it would be lower. Went, yeah, you could go to Tennessee where it's lower. There you go. But it, it is definitely, I, I mean, we're, we're not making this profession attractive. Uh, preparation. There is research that shows the less prepared you are, the less, the more likely you are to leave. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? You're frustrated, you, you know. Uh, mentoring induction. We know that makes a difference. Uh, very few, it's expensive. Very few places have it. I don't know if you have it here in Washington with any sort of depth or comprehensiveness. Many states have tried it, but again, budget cuts come and you know, there it goes. Uh, teaching conditions, you know, all the time you hear really the, one of the most uh, common things that teachers say is lack of administrative support, lack of leadership from the principal. Uh, my mother was a principal. It's a very tough job. I saw it up close and personal for many years. And uh, I, I think that a school can't be better than the principal. Uh, have you ever seen a school where it was great but the principal was lousy? I mean, it just, the, the leader really sets that tone. And if you don't have that leadership, that's, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for a great school. Um, so that's pretty huge. The turnover, I don't talk much in here about principals, but the turnover of principals are really, really challenging as well. Um, lack of resources, time for planning, lack of career advancement options. Our millennials, a lot of you are in that category. I mean, millennials want to do their thing. It's, you know, my mother's generation, you go into teaching, you stay for 30 years, you know, you become a teacher, she became a principal, and that kind of worked. That doesn't work anymore. And I don't think that as a profession, we have contributed much thinking on different differentiated roles in our schools. I mean, we still have this model from 50 years ago, 30 students and a teacher, special ed, we have paraprofessionals, but you know, look at like medicine. You've got four or five different roles now, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, et cetera. We, we, we have not created roles where, for example, I think if we have people who want to teach for two years, I think that's awesome. But you don't throw them into the highest need class and call them teachers. Let's put five of them there with a master teacher and say two years, just stay for two years. You don't have to pretend like you're trying to be a teacher. <laughs> but we need you, we want you. You're smart, you're motivated, you wanna make a difference. Let's create a business model and a structure so that can happen. So again, we, we, we are behind the times as a system, I believe. And I, I think that doesn't get much discussion in my world. I, maybe it does in yours, but uh, you know, it's, it's a problem, I think. Um, lack of professional autonomy, all the standardized test scores that, you know, has really turned a lot of teachers off. Uh, and retirement. A lot of people are retiring early, leaving. And the aging of the cohort. Uh, demographic mismatch. You all know this. 
I mean, all you have to do is walk into a school out here, I'm sure. 50% of the population, uh, student population, is people of color, 18% teachers, people of color, and 75% female. And that just increasingly gets more and more obvious. Again, there's some new research. Are you all on Twitter? I love Twitter. I learned so much from Twitter. I highly recommend it if you're not. Even Ken's on Twitter, so we can all get on Twitter. I use it like a news feed, but there, I ran across an article um, that a research that was done that says uh, if the teacher is of the same race of the student, there is l the suspension rate goes down. Makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of important implications there. What deters potential teachers? Uh, the cultural and policy messages about teaching. I mean, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend to any of my kids to become a teacher. I don't know what a sad thing to say, but it's not a very attractive career these days. Uh, millennials, as I said, different kinds of jobs, salary and working conditions, and there are so many other career options now. Um, what the research on labor market research says that your average person graduating from college these days will have six careers in their lifetime. Careers, not jobs, careers. Some of which haven't even been invented yet. I mean, you live in the center in the heartbeat of inventing new careers out here in Seattle. But um, that, that's a whole other world, certainly not one I grew up in. Um, lack of innovation and opportunity. Um, and for minority folks, they've had a lot of bad experiences with school. Why would they want to become part of that system? Um, and with other options, why go there? <laughs> okay, you're supposed to laugh. It's not very funny, though, is it? <laughs> See, it's so bad they even have cartoons about this stuff. Uh, inequitable distribution. Again, um, the data from the Office of Civil Rights is really clear about this. If you like big data sets and are interested, there are a lot of data in there. And I believe it's all public now, isn't it? You can, you know, for those of you looking for a dissertation topic, um, there's a lot of really interesting data in there about tracking teachers and particularly the disproportionate um, distribution of teachers with experience uh, in high need schools and fields. Um, you know, it's interesting, the law, the what used to be No Child Left Behind, What's Now Every Student Succeeds Act, has always had language in there about addressing inequitable distribution. It's been in there for decades. Uh, and in fact, I think it was last year that the department required every state to submit a new plan on how they were going to address this. Did, you did that here in Washington, right. I assume. Um, I don't know if anybody's been monitoring that or not. Um, it seems to be kind of a paperwork exercise in most places. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I haven't seen any evidence that oh, somebody really tried something and it really made a difference. Uh, it's, a, it's a very challenging issue that, um, that hasn't really been addressed very well. And there's a lot of complex factors. Um, you know, one of them, of course, being teachers who are experienced. The more experience you have, the more you want to be able to choose where you want to teach. And it's tougher to teach in these schools. Uh, not so much because of the kids, but because of all those other things. Uh, you know, those are places where you need a whole lot of support and a whole lot of mentoring and induction and expertise, and those are the places that are, that are least likely to have that. So, let's shift and see what's happening at the federal level and if there might be some openings here. Um, to address those challenges we've been talking about. As Ken said, there is a lot going on in the policy world. Um, and we're about to have a big turnover uh, in people who are leading our government. 
this makes a huge difference. Make no mistake about that. Um, so next week, we'll have a new president that will bring in a new cast of characters. Uh, we'll have a new Congress. We may have a Democratic Senate. We may not. I don't think the House is going to become uh, Democratic, but there may be fewer Republicans. We know some key leaders are stepping down. For example, Mr. Klein from Minnesota, who's chaired the Education and the Workforce Committee in the House, is not running again. The person moving into that slot, should the Republicans hold the House, is Virginia Fox from North Carolina. Are you familiar with her? She's very conservative. <laughs> but she does not like those teacher prep recs. <laughs> um, but again, um, and Bobby Scott, who was the lead Democrat, anybody from Virginia? He's from Virginia. Um, if Tim Kaine becomes the vice president, there's a lot of speculation that the governor of Virginia will appoint him to take Tim Kaine's seat in the Senate. So the leadership for Democrats on education will be up for grabs if, if that occurs. Uh, so that's one thing. Your own Senator, Patty Murray, who's very senior now, as you know, uh, chairs the health education, or is the ranking Democrat on the Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which is where all of this, the jurisdiction for all of this is in the Senate. Um, and she, if the Senate becomes Democratic, which looks like, I don't know, 50-50 chance. I, I can't keep up. The polls seem to be changing every day, but it's, it'll be very close. But if it does turn Democratic, she's <laughs> in a position where she could move into the leadership be potentially the number three person in the Senate because she has been there so long and has had so many leadership responsibilities. She could stay and chair this committee as the chair, not the ranking member, or she could chair the full appropriations committee. Now, she decided not to chair the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. The next person in line to do that is Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. So isn't that interesting to contemplate? <laughs> so stay tuned. Take, keep an eye out for that next week. Yeah. Does Bernie, does Bernie have a lot of interest in K-12 education? Uh, Bernie, yes. Now, the thing you've associated him with is free college, I'm right. sure. And, and that's, and labor issues. And that's what, he, you know, that has been, without question, the biggest education topic on the campaign trail is this notion of college debt and free college and that kind of stuff. A little bit of stuff on, on K-12, but not too much. Um, Bernie Sanders was the only member of that committee years ago that many of us got to offer an amendment to close the loophole in highly qualified. And that was the loophole saying that you could be the teacher of record while you're still learning how to be a teacher. And he, he was into it. He offered the amendment, did not pass. Uh, but he offered it, and he was into it, and I think that he is, is really open to this. You know, I was reading this morning again on Twitter um, that, <laughs> yeah, you think I get paid by them, but I don't, um, that um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are leading the charge against that ballot initiative in Massachusetts to expand the cap on charter schools. I thought that was really interesting. So... Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that'll be quite interesting. And, you know, those smaller states like Vermont, like Alaska, uh, like Hawaii, where there's not a huge population, they are really responsive to their constituents because there's not that many of them. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but that really, you can really see that working uh, with senators. Um, so the teacher prep regs, I'm going to get into those next. The implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act. The Higher Ed Act is going to be reauthorized next year. It's number one on everybody's list, no matter who takes over on the Hill. And then there's a new bill that was introduced that I'm going to talk about a little bit. So the teacher prep regs. Everybody's read these, I'm sure, right? 700 pages, not required reading for your class. Well, there won't be a quiz. <laughs> Um, so this has been going on for five years. I'm afraid to tell you I've been there for five whole years watching this up close and personal. Um, this is more or less the same proposal that the department's been pushing for five years. 
Um, these are regulations taking their authority from the Higher Education Act. What they say is that every state must rate every teacher preparation program. They're actually 27,000 plus now. That figure's a little out of date. Every year, based on four specific metrics, which are student outcomes, student learning outcomes, surveys, surveys of principals and recent graduates, employment and retention, where are they working, how long do they stay, and program approval. There are certain requirements. You either have to be professionally accredited, which kind of isn't happening right now, or you have to meet certain standards in your state program approval. Only, there, there are three ratings. You're either rated low performing, uh, at risk, or okay, I don't, effective, I guess. Um, <laughs> and only those that are rated effective have access to the TEACH grants, which is a form of federal student financial aid. Do you use TEACH grants? Anybody, you use them here? Okay. Um, they're, they're pretty awesome. I mean, though they could be. I mean, it's $16,000 of scholarship money if you agree to teach in a high need school or a high need field after you get the funding. There's problems with them. They're not perfect, but um, so that is more or less what the regulation says. There were some changes from the original proposal and I, there are more changes in this, but these are, these are some of the big ones. The original proposal had four rating categories. Now there are three. There is a new student outcome measure that states can create a student learning outcome measure. So you can either measure student growth. There are three options. And you could use either one of these, three of these in combination, two in combination, whatever the state wants. Um, student growth, teacher evaluation, so long as student growth is part of it, or a measure that the state creates that is shown to relate to student learning outcomes and differentiates among teachers in at least three categories. <coughs> now what would that be, Ken? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I, I don't know. Somebody said attendance? <laughs> That's been proposed, yeah. So that means that the preparation program is now accountable for the attendance so the of the, the, the K-12 students right. in the class. Just like in medical school. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Patients show up for their appointments. Or then, not. yeah, your, your preparation program wasn't any good. So, so that's new, and the department promotes this as flexibility, state flexibility. Um, the other thing is, and this kind of blows my mind, there is a requirement in there. I, I didn't bring the regs. I should have because I, I would like to read this, but it says something on the lines of, after you get these, these measures of student learning outcomes, which, it, which the state will decide, and every state could pick different things and put them together differently, so the comparability across states is not there. Um, you must aggregate all the student learning into one measure. In other words, so you're an elementary school teacher and you graduated from the University of Washington and you have 30 kids in your class and you teach math, science, language arts, art, PE, you know, et cetera. So you have to take the learning outcome, or the state does, will take the learning outcomes for all those students in all those subjects, it's not just math and reading, and turn that into a number or a measure, a aggregate something. And that will determine partially how effective your preparation program was. Now, I, that, I cannot wrap my mind around. I'm not sure what such a thing would mean. Um, anyway, that's there. Uh, they have taken out the entry requirements. It used to be that you had to have a certain GPA or you know that that would count towards your rating. There's no more of that. There are exit requirements. 
um, and there's no weighting of indicators. In other words, you have those three indicators and the state can weight them any way they want. The state can add other indicators. So you can have 20 indicators and rate each one, you know, a few points. So, you know, one of my beefs with this is that one of the arguments that's made in support of this is that it will give transparency and data to protect it to potential candidates. I'm all for that. But seriously, what are you going to learn when you get, like, all this is going to be lumped into one of three ratings, and every state's going to do it differently, and I'm just not sure how that's going to help you to know much. Um, my prediction is we're going to see this turn out the way teacher evaluation did, where, you know, everybody's rich and good looking and, you know, because it's just impossible to do it. So I think when you ask people to do things that can't be done, they make stuff up. That's what I do. I mean, I, I mean like if you can't, <laughs> no state has the capacity to do this. It's never been done. We begged Arne Duncan to pilot this, and he did not want to pilot this, because anything this huge, you know there are going to be unintended consequences. Maybe it is a great idea. I don't know. But I, I mean, do you, are your, is your State Department sitting around, like, got a lot of time on their hands? And Do you have a data system here in Washington where you can link the graduate of every program to the student outcomes of every student back to the program? Well, do you know you have to have that ready by next May? Yeah. yeah. No, we, don't. We, can't, we can't do the student outcomes piece or the teacher evaluation. We can't do any of that at all in the state. Nothing. So concerns. Number one for me is efficacy. Like, Right? Like, you know, you go through all this work, you do all of this. It, does this mean anything? This is a whole lot of effort to generate something that I don't see how it's really going to provide accurate information uh, to anyone. Um, cost and capacity, we were just talking about that. The department has estimated <laughs> Their original proposal said it would be $42 million over 10 years. Well, that was a typo, apparently. It's $42 million every year. Did you know that? Did you catch that? So re read the fine print. Uh, you know, the state of California alone has said that it's like four, what, $280 million or something just to even set up the capacity to do this. Um, the student financial aid precedent, and this is huge for colleges and universities at large. Uh, right now, federal financial aid is dependent upon the eligibility of the student. That's all your Title IV funding, your uh, Pell scholarships, your, um, you know, the loans, et cetera. This says access to student financial aid is now dependent upon the rating of a program based on this system. That is a huge change in student financial aid policy. And guess what? If that happens here, that's going to happen with other student financial aid. There's just no question about it. Uh, the last one, and this is where our K-12 colleagues really go wild. Um, this regulation says that you must assess all non-tested grades and subjects. So like the example I gave with the elementary students, the um, PE and the art and the social studies and everything else, you ha those, all those students have to be annually assessed and that, those learning outcomes are rolled into this measure. Now we just had a new K-12 law passed, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and they explicitly rejected that. There was huge discussion about testing. And you know, that was a part of the waivers. You had, you had a waiver, that was real controversial out here though, but that was a part of the waivers. So many, every state that had a waiver has been doing that. Now California is a state that didn't have a waiver. You didn't, I know it was rejected. Yeah, they took it away. They took it away. Um, so here again, this is a higher ed regulation undermining a bipartisan K-12 bill that was just enacted. So there are a lot of concerns.
so several organizations, and I can send you the link to the letter. Uh, this coalition of organizations got together and wrote a letter last week. It's on the AACTE website, among many other places. If you haven't, if you all haven't gone to that website, they have everything in the world about the teacher prep regs. Pros, cons, background information, et cetera. But all of these organizations signed a letter that basically outlined all those concerns I said. This is a bad idea. We don't have the money. This does not have efficacy. This violates ESSA. This is a huge shift in higher ed student aid policy. Um, and we as organizations are committed to continuing to make our voice heard and to advocating, raising these concerns and getting them addressed. Um, so the ones I put in red, I think this is like an amazing sort of list of groups. You don't often get this on an education letter. You've got presidents of universities, the American Council on Education. That is the umbrella organization that pretty much every president of every university belongs to. Um, you've got the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Again, these are presidents. These are not colleges of education. These are presidents of Hispanic or of minority serving institutions. Um, You've got, uh, I didn't, the uh, American Association of State Colleges and Universities, that's another presidential association. You've got both unions, the AFT, the NEA. You have got the um, American Indian Higher Ed Consortium. These are tribal colleges, universities, and more. Um, the Christian colleges are up there. You've got special ed, several special ed groups up there. You've got the STEM coalition, the STEM education coalition there, which is made up of all sorts of STEM related groups. You've got the National Governors Association. That's huge. And, and the National Conference of State Legislators. That was going to be my next one. Because that's where the money's going to have to come from. I mean, that's, and, and they are concerned. So this is a pretty remarkable response to a regulation in terms of the diversity there. So this just came out last week. Um, what the next steps are are under development, but I think it's really important for you to know this is not teacher ed fighting with critics. This is a lot of broad concern. Um, so just some more information. Boy, that's out of date. Oh, no, it's not. They were, yeah, they were just issued. They're final. There's guidance coming. That should be any day, maybe on the day of Kate Walsh's report. Maybe they'll come out together. Uh, they do tend to orchestrate these things. Support has come from Arnie Duncan. He wrote a letter. Um, the New York Times had an op-ed endorsing these, NCTQ, a uh, number of reform groups, Dean for Impact. So all these letters and statements, again, are on the AACT website. Uh, the concerns that coalition has raised them, Chairman Alexander and Chairman Klein have both sent very strong statements criticizing them. Now, these are both Republicans. They're the education leaders, but, you know, lobbying uh, bombs at the Obama administration is, is a sport, of course, so it almost doesn't matter what they say. If it came from Obama, they don't like it, um, which puts the Democrats in a hard position, frankly. It's been challenging to get them to really be critical because this is Obama and we're in the mid middle of such heavy-duty political season. There is a policy rider um, that was attached to the appropriations bill in the House. Now, you know, the Congress couldn't get their work done, so they passed a funding bill that goes until December 7th or 9th. And so they'll come back November 15th after the election's over into what's called a lame duck session. So they have to do something about funding the government unless we close the government down, which I don't think that worked very well last time. So 
there's a lot of pressure to get something done. And there are bills that have worked their way. There are 12, 12 funding bills, and they're in different stages in the two bodies. And they are right now trying to sort of put one bill, to, you know, mush them all together and get a bill that will provide funding through the next fiscal year, which is uh, September 30th, 2017. The bill that is on the House side for education spending had a policy rider blocking these regulations, along with a whole lot of other policy riders, like blocking Obamacare, you know, very political, very controversial. The Republicans, you know, took that approach in the House. All of their Republican agenda is on this funding bill as policy riders. The Democrats have taken a position, no policy riders. Because there's like 350 of them or something, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So it's a challenge to pluck out this one and say, you know, this is a bipartisan one. And, you know, it just, it makes it very difficult to do. Uh, but that's still something that's out there under deliberation. Um, the HEA reauthorization next year, when that comes up, uh, if the law is significantly changed, the regulations will have to be changed. Um, who knows what will happen then? And again, Congress is not real speedy, so how quickly that will happen is another question. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, no. Can I guarantee it's going to be done there? No. Uh, but I do think you know, there's a lot of momentum, especially with this whole business of community college, free college, and debt, and it's in line next. You know, they finished ESSA, so there will definitely be momentum. Will it be accomplished? It's another story. Uh, and then actions of a new administration. People said, well, couldn't the new, couldn't the Clinton administration or the uh, Trump administration or the Stein administration um, just erase these off the books? Yes, they could. Uh, Trump probably erased the entire department, so that. <laughs> uh, but let's say it is Clinton. Um, you know, you got to look. I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is to that. A lot of people who are advising her are from a place called the Center for American Progress, which is where a lot of the Obama people who supported this went. And there's a lot of, they have come out supporting these wrecks. Now, Clinton is also very heavily advised by both unions, who really don't like these. So that is going to be really interesting to watch, how she manages this coalition of advisors. Uh, you know, charter schools has been another one. There's been a lot of, does she support them? Does she support them? She's kind of said mixed things, and people are kind of duking it out inside the tent, I think. So we'll see. Uh, ESSA, you all are in the middle of that here. These are just some of the big things that are now at the state and district level. Uh, what is an effective teacher? State has to decide that. Uh, state certification. State certification is now the default um, standard with highly qualified is gone. So what does that mean? Some places you can be certified because you can breathe. Uh, I don't know what it's like here, but you know, with the pressure of the shortage, we have seen a lot of states dropping those standards. Um, teacher and principal academies. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the GREAT Act. This is basically, there is a provision in the new law that says a state can take up to 2% of its funding and create what's called these new academies. These academies are basically charter schools airlifted into teacher prep. And that's what they say. That's what they are. The state can make them, the state's in charge um, if you want to open up or if your grandmother wants to open a teacher prep program and she spent her whole law life being a seamstress, but she's got a great idea. I'm not picking on your grandmother, but I'm just saying. And, this, and she happens to know some people in the state, and they think it's a great idea. Here you go. Here's a couple of million. I'm being a little sarcastic there. But this is exactly the structure that has been put forward. And it explicitly says you cannot require these things to do all the things that higher ed is required to do. Those are prohibited. You can't have faculty qualifications. You can't have a specific course of study, yada, yada. Uh, will states choose to do that? Not this state. Not this state. 
All right, that's good. Uh, other uses of Title II funds. There's a lot of great stuff in there. Creating residency programs, grow your own programs, tar targeting strategies to recruit minorities from high school. I mean, again, there is a lot of great opportunity in there. But the politics of state decision making, that's where it's at. So important to be a part of that. Um, higher ed reauthorization. I don't think I'm going to say too much more about that. Um, I think we have been successful in working with these three offices to get a bill called the Educator Preparation Reform Act um, introduced. It's a bill to reauthorize Title II of the Higher Ed Act. And Reed, Casey, Hunt have all been wonderful. I'm sure we'll go back at it next year, probably rewrite it. Um, but we, we do have a legislative vehicle and some leadership to begin to address some of this. So that's a really important thing to remember. Um, again, this is, this is nothing you don't know. This really speaks to what I think we know as a field and the story I don't think we've told very compellingly. Uh, about the resident, you have a fabulous residency program here, which does get certainly attention. I think we featured it in a briefing that the Coalition for Teaching Quality did in Washington. There are others that are outstanding. Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, EdTPA, you may have your issues with that. A lot of people do. But the point is, that was a metric developed by the field to hold ourselves accountable. Whatever your thoughts are about Pearson, I'm happy to talk further about it. But as a field, we need to stand up and say, this is how we know what we're doing makes a difference. And that train has left the station. If you don't think we need to do that as a profession, let's talk. Because the policymakers see that they don't believe we do it, so they're doing it for us. That's the opening we give them when we fight about Oh, I don't like EdTPA. I don't like Pearson. I, you know, I'm being a little sarcastic there, but you know that policymaker walk right into that. They can't decide, so I'll decide for them. And they are not informed by us. They are informed by other people with agendas that may or may not be professional agendas. Um, I had an example here of a wonderful program, which I think I'm going to skip. It's five minute video. Um, you, you can all have my slides. You can watch it. It's really a fabulous program if you if you get a chance in to Chicago. look in Chicago to look at. It. It's a great partnership between higher ed and community organizations where teacher candidates go live in the high need communities with families for the summer and really become a part of that community. It's a recruitment strategy um, and a retention strategy that has great outcome at least five years, students staying in the classroom in the community kind of thing, but it's a very uh, cool program. So what do we do? We have to tell our story. That's, I mean, we just haven't organized ourselves to really tell our story well. There are a lot of ways to do that. Um, these are just some things to think about. Who are your allies? Always better to tell your story with people who can vouch for what you're saying. We look very self-interested as teacher educators. I always say when you go to the Hill, take someone who went to your program, who can talk, who, who's now the teacher of the year, who can say, I wouldn't have been here if I hadn't been in this program. I mean, that is so much more powerful than you saying, oh, we have a great program. Yeah, well. Um, you know, who are your allies? I used to say to all the deans, you should have up on your website every graduate of your program that's gotten any kind of honor. Because that is your best commercial. And we've got them. I work for the National Network of State Teachers of the Year. These folks came through teacher prep programs. You know, they, they, we should have really strong alliances with our stellar alumni. I mean, that's one example. You know, the other thing I think is that a lot of people, I, I actually left my job at AACTE two years ago because after working with higher ed for so long, I realized that 
we do not acculturate people in higher ed to be engaged in policy. That is not part of doctoral preparation. That is not part of our culture. And this is the price we pay. So my mission now, poor Selma knows this too well, um, is to work with doctoral students so that when they finish their doctoral program, and do our doctoral students are the leaders of our future in this field, they will have a sensibility of policy. They will know how to be engaged, why it matters, and, and, and how to do it. And I always say, make it easy. This is not rocket science. Put a sticky on your computer. Have you contacted your legislator this week? Send them some good news. You got a grant. Doesn't have to be a big deal, but it, you know, build a relationship. Let them know you're a constituent. Let them know you're out here. Let them know what's going on. They like, believe me, every member of Congress and the staff, the more they know about the cons their constituents, the smarter they feel, the smarter they are. They can go to meetings and say, well, that's not what happens in my district. I was just talking to Selma and she's been out of the schools and she told me blah, blah, blah. But uh, they really, they, you're, you are their eyes and ears on the ground, even if you don't agree with them. I, even if they don't, you know, if, they're, if you think, oh my God, that person couldn't care less. That, that has not been the experience I have. They want to know what's happening in their district. So think about something easy you can do. They're all on Twitter. Every single congressional office has a Twitter feed. That is a really easy thing to do. Just, you know, copy them and tweet out something you wrote, whatever, picture of Ken giving a lecture, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, invite them here, you, or their staff. You would be shocked. They love to come, teach a class. Give them an award <laughs> for your leadership and education. Photo op with the kids. You know, there's politics. Take them to the school. Let them meet the, uh, you know, the student teacher and have a sit down. And they, this is really. Uh, it's a lot easier than you would think. It, it, it really is. Um, and the, the last one, too, is, I, I, and I just tweeted an article out about this this morning, about publishing in journals, how we talk to each other. And this article, I don't know if this is true, it said that the average journal article is read by 10 other people in, the li in their lifetimes. Now, that was not just in education. That was in, I don't know, what, what field that is. Maybe it's not 10, maybe it's 100, but I can tell you they're not policy makers. We gotta find better ways to communicate. You know, they, they, Valerie Jarrett, who is Obama's top domestic policy council person, and this is, I have a friend who works in the White House, and she told me this, you wanna get her attention? 10,000 tweets on the topic. Suddenly, it's on the agenda. She's not reading journal articles. But you can tweet about your journal articles.